So I'm going to present an 2018 update on what's happening with some aspects of mobile research. Now, why am I calling this an update? That's because I have done mobile presentations in previous years, and whilst some of that information is still relevant, I don't need to rehash it. So I will occasionally refer to an earlier presentation. If I do, they're on our Play Again facility, so you can go back and get some of that information if you've not caught those presentations before. So this is very much an update. I'm going to be taking us through three parts. So um, you'll be able to get a grab of three different aspects of mobile research. So I'm first gonna have a look at what's been happening with mobile usage and having an update on that. I'm going to have a look at where we're going with mobile first and questionnaires and then finish up by having a look at the exciting bit of what's perhaps next. So if we have a look at what's been happening, I'm going to have a look at a few of the statistics that are published by some of the agencies around the world that give us that data that gives us that rich picture of what's happening in various places around the world. So what we know when we bring all this data together is that mobile just keeps growing. This is um, a chart from the Pew Research Center in the US and it shows from 20, 2008 to 2018 what's been happening with the growth of devices. So you can see there we've got a line for smartphone and a line for tablet and you can see that both of those devices have just been growing really strongly over the last 10 years. So much more smartphone usage, much more tablet usage. Then if we have a look at, at the global situation and have a look at what's been happening with mobile broadband, this is some data that comes out of, um, from the report called Measuring the Information Society. That's from the ITU. They publish a range of great statistics. So if you're after the nitty gritty of a whole lot of information about connections, different sorts of mobile connectivity from around the world in a whole range of countries. They are a really rich resource of information and you can spend hours and hours, days and days plowing through all of their information. But what you can see here is the growth in active mobile broadband subscriptions. So you can see across the world for the last 10 years, really, really strong growth in mobile broadband. And if we then start to have a look at, at these global differences in usage, each of these lines represents a different part of the world. So we've got an orange line that shows us the number of connections per 100, 100 inhabitants for the world. But then you can see a line for the developed world the developing world and less developed countries. And you can see that those rates of subscriptions are just continuing to grow. But you can see that we have much higher levels of connectivity in the developed world and much lower levels of connectivity in the developed world. So growing everywhere, but still there are parts of the world where connectivity is relatively low. And we need to remember that when we're doing global studies. Sometimes for people who work in developed countries, you actually get used to almost everybody having internet, having access, having a smartphone. And it's sometimes when you move into global studies, really important to remember that at different parts of the world, these figures can be radically different. So key point to take away is mobile keeps growing but not everybody is connected yet. And what are some other changes that have been happening? This is some data that comes out of Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report. For those of you who like to follow what's happening in the IT, the internet, the mobile space every year, and in around about May, so I would be expecting to see something relatively soon, Mary Meeker puts out an enormous deck of charts 
that go through a really broad range of statistics relating to IT, internet usage, mobile uses. Um, different years, they'll focus around different themes. So it's really an interesting one to keep an eye out for. Now this chart is showing the hours per day that an adult spends with digital media from 2008 through to 2016. And you can see there the, the amount of time that people are spending online has grown really steadily. But if you have a look at that, you'll see that a lot of that growth is really being driven by people spending time on their mobile devices with digital media. So mobile is really driving this growth in time people are spending with digital media. If we then have a look at US advertising revenue, we still see that growth. But again, we see this same theme. It's mobile, spend on advertising on mobile platforms that's driving that growth. So it really highlights the importance of mobile in this whole idea that we're spending so much more time online. The other thing to keep in mind is the picture of mobile usage can be quite complicated. Sometimes when you look at averages or top line figures, you think, oh, yes, you know, this is growing, everybody's the same. But if you have a look at the data underneath, sometimes you'll be in for some surprises and the picture isn't always as clear when you dig beneath the surface. Now, this is an example more to illustrate why you need to drill down into these figures. So if your question was, which countries in the Asia Pacific region are leading the way in using mobile surveys, you could look at this and you say, well, Australia's out in front, but Indonesia's also strong. So this is the percentage of spend on surveys that are being spent on mobile surveys. So you can see the figure there for Australia is 19, Indonesia's 10. So you may start to think, oh, Indonesia is looking a bit like it's following the pattern of Australia. And this is data from the SMR GMR report. But if we then drill a little bit deeper and say, okay, Indonesia and Australia, what other modes are popular in those countries? You start to see that although from a mobile perspective, you might think they're similar, from a general data collection mode perspective, they're actually very, very different. The dominant mode in Australia is online, whereas the dominant mode in Indonesia is very much face-to-face. -face. So when you think of the whole spend on surveys, they're actually very different countries, but in some ways they might be superficially the same. So it's a, a cautionary tale to really dig down and look at these things in detail because there's often complications. Sometimes developed countries have very similar profiles. Sometimes less developed countries use more advanced technologies because they've leapfrogged. So if you're doing international research, you really, really need to think about these things. And we would always suggest if you're trying to do mobile research in a country that you're not that familiar with, you really do need to have a local partner, somebody who can advise you about these sorts of things. So last year, we spent a lot of time talking about the importance of mobile first questionnaires. And so just to recap, why were we so keen to make you realize how important mobile is? And that's because we believe it's really quite essential for your survey research currently. Now, this is a bit of a, a repeat from a previous presentation, but it's really important, so I just wanted to recap it in this presentation. You need mobile because you have to have the coverage. If you think back to those charts that we've seen now, the growth, the dominance of mobile, particularly in driving some of that growth in time spent online, if you're not making your surveys mobile friendly, mobile accessible and mobile first, you're going to have a coverage problem with your sample. And beyond the mechanics of making sure your research design and your sampling is sound, it's also a question of respect. If we're asking people to give up their time 
to take part in surveys, we really want to be able to offer them to them in modes that suit their lifestyles. So we consider it to be quite disrespectful to not provide mobile friendly, mobile first surveys. And another really strong reason why mobile is essential is it's going to happen anyway. People started doing mobile surveys by completing online surveys on their mobile devices. Researchers didn't start doing this. It was our respondents who started doing online surveys on mobiles. So essentially, this has been a participant-led idea. So if people are going to do our surveys on their mobiles anyway, we need to make sure that the software that we're offering people, the way the online surveys function, have to work on mobile. Otherwise, we will have problems with our data and participants won't like taking part in online surveys and that has all sorts of problems for the future of our industry. So how do you get to mobile first? Mobile first is one of those things that we often talk about, but sometimes it's difficult for people to understand exactly what they need to do to make their surveys mobile first. And what you really need to be doing is thinking about mobile from the very beginning of your study. Think about it at the design stage, at the questionnaire stage, all throughout the project. But if you wanted to keep one thing in mind to help you think about mobile first, I would encourage you to keep the word length in your mind and think about the length of a number of aspects of your study. So think about the overall length of your questionnaire. We know that long questionnaires don't work well on mobile. People don't actually like long questionnaires on online surveys they complete on a PC, but we know when people complete long questionnaires on mobiles, we get things like more dropouts. So you really need to be questioning the length of your survey. Also think about the length of your actual questions and also the instructions that go with them. If you write really long questions and really long instructions, you're spending a lot of screen space on those words. And there's also evidence that sometimes people get confused by long instructions. Sometimes thinking about ways to shorten a question can actually help you write a better question. And things like long response lists, they can run off the screen, they can cause problems, but it often encourages you to really think about what's the essence, what actually am I asking, what do I need to know? Attribute statements. Now, grids are never a good idea on mobile devices, but if you start putting long attribute statements into grids, you'll get real problems. And sometimes batches of grid, batches of attributes in grids, when you think about how can I fix this, you actually go back to first principles and think, well, what is it that I actually need to know? What am I wanting to ask? And it will often result in a much better question being asked than a grid with a lot of attributes. And also think of scale points, and that can be the number of in terms of length. Do you really need to have a 10 point response scale? There is evidence that shorter scales can perform quite well. Maybe you could be having a three point scale that will fit much more nicely, and maybe it's actually even easier for your respondents to answer accurately. So really question everything, but one simple way of thinking about it for mobile is to question length. So another thing that people sometimes wonder when they're faced with a questionnaire that isn't really working on mobile, how about we just make it landscape? We'll put a little message in and we'll say to the respondent, can you turn your phone around? We know that most people use their phone in what we would call a portrait style, but we can ask them to turn it around. And what we've been discovering is no, that does not work. Even when people are asked to rotate their phone, they tend not to. So you can't use that, it's not an easy fix. And the other thing that worries people when they start thinking about transitioning to a mobile first 
mode is, won't it change my results? And the answer is, often it will change your results, but you need to think about why is it changing my results? If the results are changed because actually you've increased your coverage, you've got more people, a better quality sample responding to your questionnaire, that's actually a good outcome. If it's changing your result because you've not implemented it properly, it's not really working on mobile, that's actually not good. So think about how going to mobile can improve your study and if you're improving it, that's great. You may need to think about what that means for things like longitudinal studies, benchmarks. There are things you can do to manage that transition. Sometimes people just take an approach and say, we are changing this, we're making it better. We're happy with that and we will forego legacy tracking measures. So what's next in mobile? I'm not gonna to talk too much about this because there are other people who are going to be covering this, but we're certainly going to see more interest in sensors and passage, passive data collection, which we've been talking about for a while. We're starting to see some action with chatbots. I think we're starting to rethink voice in the age of smart speakers. And obviously we've got the internet of things coming up on the horizon. So in terms of passive data and sensors, collecting data via sensors, it's not quite there yet. It's tantalizingly close, but we've still got some issues. Um, some of those issues include things like device issues. There can be compatibility. Battery life is sometimes problematic if you ask somebody to you know, keep a diary over the course of their day often we'll find that people's batteries are just getting too flat towards the end of the day. So sometimes that results in missed measurement, but these are things that we'll be able to deal with. We need to think about the willingness of participants. Not everybody wants to take part and not everybody can take part. And these sorts of issues can have impact, impacts on our samples. So those need to be considered. We will be talking a lot about what informed consent means in the context of these sorts of measurement techniques. Informed consent, how much does somebody have to understand what we're doing to be able to give their informed consent? And we really need to see more pilots and trials happening so we get more of an understanding of the method. So we're starting to see some chatbot surveys. In many cases, the idea of a chatbot survey on a mobile device feels like a really natural fit for those of you who are used to texting, messaging. It feels really nice. I'm not gonna talk much about that because Rosie Aoub has a session later on this. And I'm wondering if we'll start to revisit what voice means on mobile. Initially, the voice capabilities on a mobile tended to mean caddy surveys, but on a mobile, or sometimes an IVR style survey. But in the age of smart speakers and AI, when we're getting used to talking to our Google device or Alexa or Siri, I think we'll start to see some interest and some interesting options around collecting data via voice in not the way we have done in the past. And I think there's a big question mark there there could be lots of new stuff that we've not even thought of coming out of some of this new technology. So thanks very much for listening to me and I look forward to any questions that you might have.